you for joining us for today's Ipsos webinar, Exploring the Market Potentials of the Metaverse and Web3. Today's presentation is being given by Ipsos Research Experts in Media, Entertainment and Technology Sectors, and you can read more about them on the slide in front of you. So, now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Nicole Massa, Senior Vice President with Ipsos's Media Development Team. Nicole, you have the floor. Thank you. And thank you again for joining us today. We're really thrilled to be here. As Web3 continues to be top of mind for brands and marketers, we want to be able to support as Web3 strategies are being developed and optimized. Today, we will discuss three major components to consider through the stages of planning. Audiences, including awareness, behaviors, interests, and intent, technology and the user experience, and how Web3 is finding its place in an evolving world. Each of these contribute to determining the best formula needed to create a unique and authentic experience for your brand and your audience within Web3. As we go through this webinar, you will notice we utilize the terms immersive experiences and metaverse interchangeably. As audiences continue to gain awareness of Web3, we want to ensure we highlight the evolution and understanding of audiences across the board. By utilizing terms that audiences might be more familiar with, we can get a better sense of people's current behaviors and intent. Now, before we dive in, let's take a quick journey. Let's imagine in 10 years, you have extended reality contacts that connect to your smart earbuds. You're traveling in a new city and want to buy a new sweater. So you ask your virtual assistant, where can you find a clothing boutique that has cardigans available in your usual budget, which she already knows. The busy street in front of you slightly goes out of focus as your virtual assistant pulls up the nearest store options for you. You select a store that's 30 blocks away by foot. Your virtual assistant offers you different route options. And while doing so, you notice your favorite taxi app is offering a deal today. So you say taxi and it sends a driver automatically to you. Once you get to the store, you find a sweater you like. As you pick it up, your XR contacts sync with a virtual menu and storefront that offer you different options to choose from. You could try on the sweater using a virtual mirror. You can access your digitalized closet to compare the sweater against what you already own. And you can purchase the sweater right there using virtual currency like your crypto wallet or phone pay. Your virtual assistant then notifies you of a deal the store is offering. To add a virtual stylist to help you style the sweater with the clothes you have in your closet or help you find additional options in the store. A metaverse would blend digital information and access with the physical world. This would truly be digital. And now I would like to turn it over to Yana. Great, thanks, Nicole. So as we you can go ahead with the next slide, thanks. As we talk about more immersive experiences, uh, as Nicole mentioned, the term metaverse has been used many different ways over the last several months, ever since it exploded into mainstream media. The idea of a metaverse has become a vision for a new futuristic way to market to consumers, to facilitate e-commerce, and even bring physical experiences into digital ones. It's a vision that will require a connected ecosystem of many digital technologies. Those are shown here on the right side of the slide. And they're going to need to work together seamlessly to provide a way for physical and digital worlds to merge and provide a blended digital experience. However, we need to remember this is a vision that doesn't quite exist yet. Next slide. Currently, extended reality is an umbrella term for technology that connects physical and virtual together. And you can think about the different types of experiences as different levels of immersion. Virtual reality is probably the most common way we think of immersive experiences, using a VR headset, making an avatar of yourself, or interacting with 3D virtual objects with floating virtual hands. 
Headsets and accessories allow the user to map their body or head movements in the digital space, so they feel as if they're actually there. VR is full immersion, so people are disconnected from the physical space or the world around them. Next slide. One level up from that is mixed. Headsets like HoloLens and Magic Leap add virtual overlays to our real environment, like you can see in this video, where we have 3D interactive models or screens that are located around the kitchen. Now, mixed reality isn't yet widely used by consumers, but it is being used by industry. For example, a mechanic wearing a mixed reality headset may receive digital overlay of information and images that could help them diagnose and solve a car malfunction. <clears throat> they would still have to fix the car, but their headset might help them gauge you know, the proper alignment that would be required for, for the fix that they need to make. Next slide. Augmented reality is another part of extended reality and can be used for experiences like virtual product try-ons or even AR clothing that maps to your body in real time. Augmented reality overlays digital objects onto the physical world and allows for light interaction to turn or place a digital object. Augmented reality doesn't really block out the physical or real world completely, so it doesn't allow for as much immersive interactions. Most augmented reality experiences, though, are used on legacy devices like smartphones, and as a result, these are more accessible for wider audiences and really a gateway for customers to start exploring the ways digital and physical experiences can start to intersect. In the future, the extended reality devices may be combined so people can decide the contexts in which they want 100% immersion or perhaps a less immersive experience. Now I'll hand it over to Natalie. Great, thank you, Yana. So we'd like to just switch gears a bit and talk about the relationship between these terms and how consumers are both engaging, what their level of awareness is, and their interest in these types of immersive experiences and all of the things that come around that. One of the first things we're just going to look at is the level of awareness. What we're seeing here is the level of awareness for various terms. And what's really interesting as you go through this and the different bars represent different age groups here, is that if you look at virtual reality, which has the highest level of awareness, with about 72% saying they know a lot or a little, moving down to augmented reality, metaverse still at majority, NFTs just slightly under majority, Web3 being the lowest at about 24% who say they know a lot or a little. But this awareness actually carries across all of the age groups and just slightly declines as we get to those over 40. These results are from a new syndicated study that we've released that came out of field just the end of June and covered this 13 to 55 age range in the US. So while we see consistency across age groups, one of the consistent unfortunate situations we see is a pervasive gender gap that will need to be addressed as we seek to engage a broader audience in these kind of immersive experiences. And that gender gap interestingly carries through across the age groups. So, for example, if we just dive in specifically and look at those who know a little or a lot about the metaverse, you can see that even among teens, 13 to 17, the age gap is 23 points, sorry, the gender gap between men and women. And why that becomes particularly important is if we look at the sense of affinity and how that's correlated with awareness. So we ask people, do you feel the metaverse is for people like me? And while on average that's about 44%, you see that that does again rise to over majority among the teens and even among those in the 18 to 40 age range. And if we cross that with awareness, of course, those that actually feel a greater affinity are more aware. So those that are engaged, and then you'll see this throughout the research, is there's a segment that is both engaged, involved, and really interested in participating. As we move through in the metaverse and these immersive experiences become more common, the question of accessibility and how we can engage across audiences will become critical. Because not only is there that interest and feeling of affinity, 
we can also investigate the interest in participating in these virtual worlds. So we said to Yana's, you know, and Nicole's discussion about fashion and how that might change in these experiences, we have almost a majority saying that they think they would learn more about fashion and trends in virtual wor worlds than they would in even shopping in the mall or online. And among those who know a lot or a little about the metaverse, half of those would actually rather attend a concert in the metaverse than a live music venue. So clearly that level of awareness and among those who are aware, there is this interest, engagement, and sense of excitement about what this will bring. So we dive a bit deeper into some of the other areas that these audiences could either participate or engage in in these kind of experiences. So this chart shows those who have not either done and are not interested, which is the gray. The middle bar are those who actually said that they have participated in these activities. And the top bar shows those that are interested. So while gaming with friends or strangers has the highest level of those who say that they've actually participated in this kind of activity and immersive experience, those who actually maybe want to explore new locales or learn a new skill, we have 61% of this 13 to 55 who are interested in doing that kind of activity. So not only is there this relatively strong awareness, we see of course that gender gap, but there is this real strong interest in exploring what's possible in these virtual worlds. And in, in terms of actually why we think this is so high, there is actually over a majority who actually think that these immersive experiences will make playing games better than the way we do things today. 53% say that they think entertainment will be better than the way we do things online today. However, if we go down these different levels of activity, one of the things that we see, and this is a tension that will exist, is that ability to be your true self in a virtual world, with only four in 10 saying that they feel that that will be better in a metaverse than the way it is today. So again, positive momentum and potential, but clearly some areas where people have or feel this tension moving forward. And to talk a little bit more about that, I'm gonna hand it over to Philip. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, so yeah, so thinking about what, you know, Natalie and, and Jana just spoke about, Jana spoke a little bit about, you know, what's, what's possible. Um, Natalie spoke about where consumers are headed, what they think about, what they care about, where, where some of the gaps are in terms of what we, what we look at. Um, and so flipping it back to why think about it from a company or a brand perspective is what is the opportunity that exists today? So the first one I like to think about is, you know, if we think that the metaverse and the immersive web and Web3 and, and whatever we want to call it, we haven't even landed on a full definition yet. It's not fully here yet. It's still, it's still about potential rather than full reality as we, as we see it. And we like to liken it to the dot-com era of the late 90s, right? There was a lot of really good stuff happening, but the infrastructure wasn't here. Um, we hadn't fully activated or actualized what we were trying to do. And so there was still a lot, a long way to go. And so if we find ourselves there, we're actually at a great point in time where we can create the future web, the, um, the future metaverse that we want to be, right? So um, if the problem with that is if we're not necessarily thoughtful about that, we might just have a next gen version of what we already have, right? However, we believe there's an opportunity to create maybe perhaps a more inclusive, a safe, an equitable, and empowering future than the one that we have today. And, and there's an opportunity to bring new value to your customers so we can create the future that we want to actually have when we get into this, um, this immersive web environment and, and build it from that perspective. Um, secondly, even if you're not ready to necessarily create the future, there's a stepping stones approach to all of this or to any type of new technology or capability or what have you. This could be as advanced as you're looking to launch a store in Decentraland uh, today, if you will, and you're not necessarily doing it because you want to sell product or services or what have you. You just want to try it out and build an internal capability and way of understanding how everything is operating today what the potential is tomorrow. So, so there's things that could be done today, but you don't even have to necessarily go that far. The other thing you can start to do is to start to think about, okay, what are others doing, keeping an eye on things? It could be looking at your own consumers, your own customers and thinking, where are they headed? What do they care about? Where are they spending their time? Um, some of the data that Natalie shared, for example, 
and think about, okay, so how can we really understand changing values, shifts in behavior to really understand what we need to start thinking about for the future and when it might make sense to actually get more involved in, in all of this. And then the final thing that I think is, is a, an often understated opportunity within, within this space is just by thinking about this, just by talking about the metaverse and immersive web internally, you, you start to identify the long way to go for many organizations in, in how to get there. And it starts to put cu the current digital progress into context. Many companies we speak with say, we actually aren't as far along in our digitization as we would like to be. We're still thinking about, let's say, DTC commerce. We're thinking about um, you know, chatbots and, and AI and whatnot, but we're not necessarily fully thinking about, oh, how can you use AR to give you more transparency on product sourcing and stories related to brands or products we're selling. And I think just by looking and talking about this right now, we can start to highlight some of the gaps and start to progress sort of the nearing digital um, digitization of our companies and our brands. So that's how we think about the present opportunity. Before going further, because I'll talk about a few watch outs in a minute, I think it's always important to think about this from a historical perspective as well and looking at other technology and how it's been adopted over time. And an example we love to talk about is, let's just think very simply in terms of navigating and how we navigate the world. Um, so let's just go back 30 years and we think about, okay, if you wanted to get somewhere and go somewhere, many people had an atlas in their car, they would mark them up, they would write down what they needed to do um, to get to where they wanted to go and they might have one in the car, and look, uh, big one, they might buy smaller maps for local regional areas, and that's how they would figure out where they wanted to go. Um, then along come the 90s and, you know, let's think of the dot-com boom, and suddenly MapQuest launches, and suddenly people could say, oh, I, I don't need to have an atlas in my car all the time, but before I go anywhere, I'm still going to plan my route, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to MapQuest, put in my from to, I'm going to print that out, it's not going to print all that well because I've got ads all over the place. I haven't figured out how to optimize my sheet for printing for my home my home printer or if I go to a, a Kinko's or somewhere like that to print as well or my friend, my neighbor upstairs, um, that type of thing. And so we would print those out and we would go places. And if the map got it wrong, we would end up where we didn't want to go because there was some sort of glitch in the system, if you will. Then along comes Garmin and you have these um, sat nav systems that are on cars, um, Hertz and Avis and the rental car companies used to um, make a lot of money by selling these as add-ons when you would rent a car in terms of how you wanted to get somewhere. And this felt really great. This felt like the future was here. Suddenly I didn't have to plan all my trip that much in advance. I could just plug it in and off I go. And now we're seeing more and more phone integration into um, between um, CarPlay, et cetera, that you have in, in cars and sort of embedded within. We start to see, um, a lot easier way to get around and, and make it a lot easier. You can put in, for example, oh, I'm low on fuel, I need to find the nearest gas station, boom, it's there ready for me. And so that's sort of from a technology perspective. But if you think from a human perspective, this has also changed how we think and how we operate, right? So we went from a we went from a behavior where we would very we would very much plan what we were doing, where we wanted to go, who we would spend our time with, and you would say, hey, I'm gonna meet you outside this coffee shop. Um, at 3 p.m. on Friday in three weeks' time, right? So we would make plans like that. Um, and over time, we've moved to less and less planning in terms of our human behavior, our human activities. In fact, for where we get to, oh, is anyone around right now? And you can see who's nearby by looking on um, looking on an app, looking at your, your maps, et cetera. Or in fact, we've also, you know, the rise in ghosting culture that we have as well, where you make plans and you cancel them last minute. And I think we, we've all been there and know and know how that works. And so thinking about this, technology can actually change how we behave, how we relate to one another. And I think it'll be no different for the metaverse and immersive web as we move forward as well. So it's always worth thinking about, this is not just a technology story, but it's a human story as well. And so with that, that ties into the, the next page where we think about what are the watch outs? So we started to say what you can start to do, but there's a few things to be careful about as well. Um, the first one is you know, looking out for competition, or we like to say watch your six, or your three, your nine, your 12, any other angle as well. So if you think of like, you know, back in 2007, um, launch of an iPhone, you start, you didn't have the app store yet, but you had maps, you know, taxi services probably weren't expecting that suddenly um, this was going to completely change their category. In fact, they probably thought that um, iPhone and maps and smartphones was actually going to be great because now people were going to order more taxis to figure out where they wanted to go. 
And then along comes Uber, right? And it changes the game. It changes everything from that perspective and has spawned a bunch of copycat companies as well. And Uber itself has evolved over time. So competition can come from anywhere when you have a new technology that starts to get adopted. So I would say watch out for your own category, how you can reinvent your category, or even if a category itself disappears based on this new technology. Um, the second watch out is to be careful of just limited thinking. One of the things that we often do when there's an adoption of a new medium is to take the old rules and apply them to the new medium. So if you think back to the first ads on TV, we're typically just a static image with somebody voicing over the ad. Because what were you doing? They were copying what they did in radio back in the time. When Web 1 and Web 2 started, what you had was banner ads. And so you had suddenly banner ads which mir mirrored billboards that you would have out in public in sort of the, the earth first, as we're now calling the, 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 re the real world, if you will. And so don't be limiting your thinking to exactly following the rule book from yesterday, because I think that could change as well. So we don't want to just be a new brand, a new, another brand buying ads in this new channel, thinking about it like that, but think about how can we add value and create value for our customers and our consumers in this new medium as it emerges. And then the final one is, you know, back with that example I shared a minute ago with maps, is consider human nature, right? Any technology can be used for good, but it can also be used for bad, right? So if you think of um, everything we've had, you know, social media over the last few number of years, it has helped people connect, it has helped people stay in touch across distances, it has helped people learn, but it has also been divisive in, in other aspects from politically to misinformation, et cetera. So we have to understand that this can always be used for good and it can be used for bad. On to the next page. So, you know, we've shared a little bit of an intro and this is really what we think of the, the intro to the metaverse and, and Web3. Um, and so what have we talked about so far? We've talked about future back planning. And so how do we understand the future and work backwards from a vision of what could be to think about what are the opportunities for our companies, the risks, the questions we want to ask about. Um, we can also start to think about the trend spotting. What's changing there? Is that digital, the gender divide going to, um, going to change? And we can start to watch out for things like that. Um, some of the stats that Natalie shared that I think are really fascinating to keep an eye on in terms of, do you want to go to a concert virtually versus in person? I, 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 I myself land on the thing, of, I would love a concert in the metaverse versus having to schlep all the way somewhere to sit down and be jostled around the mosh pit. And it could just be my age. Thinking. And then finally, application and usage right so how do you start to use this technology use these devices to to build a better future for all of us and so that's a little bit of our intro um, as we go a little bit further into the next section how do you find the right formula for you for your company for your brand and there's a couple of things we think we can do here um, what we're going to talk about is what's this broader context? Maybe let's dive into the future a little bit more. I think Nicole did a wonderful job of painting a picture of what the future could hold. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the audiences these use cases could be for, and then how might those experiences actually get designed and implemented. So I'll start and then hand over to my colleagues to share a little more. Um, so going back to you know, Nicole shared a, a, that wonderful story of somebody going to buy a new sweater and you see it here on the left. Um, but you can actually think of other future scenarios and use cases as well. And this is where a lot of foresight will come in. We often start like, like to think about these from using an imaginal world where one is able to do X, Y, or Z. And so if we think of 2028, you can have that, that imaginal world where somebody's going to buy a new sweater, the XR contacts, et cetera, that Nicole spoke about. But you might also think in that world in, in just a few years time, you might think about instead of watching Netflix at home, you virtually sit on a beach in Corfu to unwind after a tough work day. And that can feel very, very real to you. Fast forward another couple of years and, and you're training new employees at your company and you're goggle sharing with them so that they can start to view the world from your exact perspective. They're actually seeing what you're seeing, hearing what you're hearing. Um, and then maybe imagine surgeons, right? We can think of other use cases, and a lot of this is outside of the consumer realm, but think of a surgeon virtually performing tomorrow's open heart surgery three times the day before using a digital twin um, of your body. So lots and lots of potential there. Again, fast forward another couple of years, imagine, you know, we still think of our smartphone as our big device purchase we have every year, every two years for many people, and that's been built into how we operate. Uh, but what if this immersive three-in-one XR, AR, VR glasses becomes the big tech purchase that we all start to do? That becomes the hub versus the phone in our pocket um, that connects our Earthverse with our Metaverse life. Um, or you might start to think about these inter-virtual world passports that is a new type of security 
um, measure for figuring out where you're going when you can go to different places because you're visiting a client secure metaverse site let's just say it's from our perspective in the services world so so we can start to think of all these various use cases they're not always going to be consumer facing they could often be the b2b applications that are equally if not more powerful in terms of how we use this so with this let me hand it back over and we can talk a bit more from natalie on on, on where else we are thank you great thanks philip and you know it's interesting if you think about these scenarios and the adoption cycle and when people will start to feel really comfortable and the level of excitement and it's interesting as we look at the different groups we talked earlier about the gap between men and women looked at age but there are many other factors that are influencing the audience and the appeal and interest of moving forward in these immersive experiences one of the really interesting parts that we found in the study was it's not just about gamers. Um, in fact, if you describe yourself as a creator or an influencer, you have the strongest, highest level of interest in participating in these kind of immersive experiences. A um, couple of other interesting things about that audience, uh, we, they're nearly double the likelihood to actually own cryptocurrency, 62% versus 31 overall, and really highly indexed on many of the measures across the various areas that we investigated in the Web3 world. The other really interesting part is the role of devices. So for example, if you own an Oculus headset, your score on this immersive 3E index is much higher than if you do not. So clearly the role of devices, and we talked about how that's going to influence this adoption and engagement, but also the level of experience that people will have as they try these out and they move increasingly into the areas. So what are we looking at in terms of people telling us in this virtual and augmented reality world? And overall, we have one in two who say that they've had some activity in VR. So the highest of that is in the VR gaming with one in five saying they're, they're doing that weekly. Also spending time with friends, participated in wellness and fitness, and you can see a variety of other activities. Now, some people might say, I'm not sure, is this really true to you know, have this proportion of people spent this amount of time in these activities. What's interesting is that even if it might not be our definition, this is a spectrum. So it's not an either or. And if people believe that this is what they're doing, it also really improves that opportunity for them to participate as they move farther and farther in or farther deeper into the types of immersion and the different types of activities that people could participate in. So the language and words become actually quite interesting in terms of what people think they're doing and maybe how others are technically it's described. And for example, if we look at that in terms of level of VR and who's active, I just want to point out a couple of things here. Again, we have the men versus women by age. But if we go to that other side, I remember the overall average was 49%. Among those that define themselves as creators or influencers, 92% say that they're active and have participated in virtual reality. 63% among gamers, 90% among Oculus owners. And interestingly, all those are slightly higher than even if you own a gaming console. Uh, so a variety of different groups. And again, we're starting to see this um, splintering in some ways of those that are engaged or feel that they are interested in doing these activities and those that maybe are lesser so. Looking at augmented reality, Yana showed a few examples of how that will work. Um, again, we have about 45%, almost the majority, who say that they've participated at some level of activity with AR. Highest here, again, video games, but about one in five saying they've used an appearance altering filter on social media. Maybe some people on this meeting have done that or seen your uh, friends or family uh, participate in those kinds of uh, sometimes and often very entertaining experiences. Um, in-store shopping, decoration, and variety of other areas in which this AR could be used. So on that, I just wanted to look at the role of avatars, another area that we look at in the survey. And it's really interesting as we talk about Web3 and this virtual reality, what it means in terms of how people will represent themselves. We wanted to get into that a little bit. So about 45% of this 13 to 55 audience say that they've created an avatar. Um, again, it's higher among that creators and influencers group. And of those, three quarters have actually created more than one avatar. If we look at the level of satisfaction, can you create an avatar that actually represents who you are as a person? About one in three say yes. 
but you can see again men much more likely than women to say that they are sat very satisfied with their ability to create an avatar that represents who they are as a person. Finally, just another note on our gamers, uh, and this is sort of more of the fun, entertaining facts. So if we look at teen gamers, two thirds actually say that they would rather watch someone else play video games than even watch popular TV shows. And a majority would actually rush to save their video games if their house was burning down. So some other, we have some other interesting facts about whether they'd rather game or eat and uh, various other statistics on this, uh, the role and commitment of gamers, um, including the fact that they spend it, we have about an average of $150 a month among those who actually spend. So I'm going to now turn it over to Yana and then we'll move back to Nicole to uh, hear from you and get some questions. Great. Thanks, Natalie. So as you saw there, you know, given the potential of immersive experiences, we'd like to see that awareness progress to activity. Um, and for that to happen, though, we need to make sure that the UX of these immersive experiences drives engagement and referral to your friends and family, right? So designing a great user experience will require your organization to be clear about the purpose of the experience and the needs of the user in that experience. For example, if the purpose of your experience is pure entertainment, then you'll need to think about what is needed to make it easy for multiple users to gather in the experience. And then you're gonna to have to be prepared for more open-ended, expansive scenarios where the users contribute and participate together. In a training experience, on the other hand, it's more likely to be a single user or one-on-one -on -one experience, and the experience will probably have a defined start and end point. It's also likely to be guided or a focused experience to ensure that the user isn't distracted from the important content that they're trying to learn. All of these experiences must also be designed for the context of the experience. So if you think of in the example of training, you may be able to anticipate that the user is going to be in a controlled environment with reliable access to stable Wi-Fi. On the other hand, many experiences in entertainment are going to happen in the wild um, probably with patchy connectivity, distractions, and users on a variety of devices and operating systems. Next slide. And since users are going to be using different kinds of devices to access immersive experiences, you will need to know what devices your users are choosing for the different types of experiences you want to create. And then you have to design experiences that will work across all the possible relevant hardware. So it won't just be a question as it has been in the past of Mac versus PC or Android versus iPhone. It's gonna be all of those and more. And many times one user will be accessing your experience across multiple personal electronic devices, kind of like the image there on the right, interoperability and portability will be required to enable seamless experiences where user data flows smoothly across those devices. Um, and creates a seamless experience. You're also um, going to want to be aware of interoperability. It's gonna be key to gaining audiences since walled gardens are currently a really big obstacle for, for people to socialize in immersive experiences. Next slide. So we'd advise you as you're thinking about what these, how you're gonna design these experiences to focus on three main considerations. First, uh, keep it simple. Right? These experiences are hard to create, but they can be really compelling. So take the time to figure out what adds the most impact to the current experience or is going to add an impact to a new experience. It doesn't have to be super complex with a lot of bells and whistles to be an amazing experience. And remember that access limitations like internet bandwidth and hardware will impact how well your experience performs for each individual user. Next, strike a balance aim to pro provide consistently high quality experiences with equipment that's affordable, easy to onboard, comfortable to use and reliable. And finally, remember that these new technologies are complex. They are more technical, they're heavier, they require more computing, and a lot of users will be learning the hardware at the same time they're getting familiar with the immersive environment. So you need to be prepared to help them troubleshoot when glitches and errors occur to ensure that they want to come back for more.
Right. So taking us into final thoughts, um, just a few, you know, one key takeaway from each of us in terms of what we've gone through today in just, you know, a short 35 minutes. Um, the first one is just thinking about your opportunities is, is just remember Web3, immersive web is still in its infancy. I mentioned the dot-com era from um, the late 90s. Think of us as being there still. Um, so let's not be constrained too much in how we think about it in terms of using how we thought about the last iteration of the web and web 2 and the social media landscape for example um, in terms of how we look at what it can be tomorrow um, so think beyond the here and now um, to envision that potential future of, of web 3 um, the future we actually want to create and help hasten so really think about it, those opportunities from that perspective not just the right today but what could be tomorrow and from an audience standpoint this is moving rapidly. In fact, people do expect this to be part of our day-to-day -day lives in the next two to five years. While consumers, some have doubt, and there is a tension in some ways between this interest and some of the concerns over privacy, we do have a majority aware, and there is among particularly certain groups within the public, really strong interest and in levels of engagement and participation in these elements of Web3. So being able to track the trends, the attitudes, the reactions, and how people are actually engaging is really critical to help optimize, but also understand how you can touch those groups that may not be quite there or have that level of enthusiasm that we're seeing among certain audiences. And then finally, as you think about how those audiences want to have these experiences, we would just encourage you to remember that Web3 is going to involve far more complex interactions and experiences. Um, the experiences that gain audiences and buzz will be those that deliver a seamless, intuitive experience, all the way from onboarding into the environment to multi-user interactions. And so users do have high expectations a lot of the times, maybe ahead of the technology. And so um, you really do need to think about how are you going to make it seamless for them to try out your experience. It's also, you know, a big part of that is it's critical to test with real users before you launch to make sure that you solve those issues that could create barriers to a great experience. And with that, I think we're going to share, you know, a little food for thought and questions to consider um, as Nicole also um, takes some questions from the chat. Uh, thank you. <laughs> that was really wonderful. I really, um, I really enjoyed everything that everybody had to say. It makes me think all the time. Um, we covered so much today. We covered, you know, strategy and positioning, audience trends, technology. There are many twists and turns when it comes to Web3. And no matter your role within Web3, there are questions. Um, we have questions all the time, um, as you can see, and we have some on the screen in front of you. Um, but we work together to kind of gain awareness and, and answer all of those questions that we have. So we do have time and we do have some questions coming in. So I'm going to grab a few and we can just kick it off. So the first question is, what are the most common misconceptions about the metaverse? So maybe Yana, you could kick that one off. Sure. So I, I do think that there is perhaps this sense that there's a metaverse out there that we can all go play in and, and interact, uh, when the reality is all those things that it takes to make a seamless experience are still being patched together. <laughs> and so um, while there's work being done and the hardware is being developed, there are still a lot of gaps in those experiences. Um, it's not seamless yet. And so, um, so we may need to be thinking about expectations of our audience and also just expectations about how far you can jump in as you're starting to think about, you know, what's the experience that you want to create. And maybe, Jan, I can just add to that. It's interesting, again, we talked about this idea of a spectrum. Philip showed how technology evolves. And we're also in that circumstance here where people may be moving into certain areas and touching one or two areas. And so this, is, this will not be like a stair, but people will gradually, and as they get more comfortable, increasingly move into this and we'll see the technology move along. So, you know, even if we think that we aren't there yet, people actually think that they're doing things in these kind of immersive experiences. And so there may be actually a bit of a disconnect between how people are viewing what they're currently doing and what our vision is in terms of metaverse and immersive experiences. And it may actually not be as far off as we think. Thank you. 
All right, so to the next one, what are ways to measure the success and ROI of initiatives within the metaverse? Great question. I can take that if you like, Nicole. So yeah, I think that's that's an interesting one because there aren't that many companies out there who can probably do a true ROI on all their activities right now. Um, so those might be a handful. You think of Roblox or Niantic who are doing, you know, Pokemon Go, for example, right? Where you're having um, experiences like that. The majority of companies, I think the ROI is not quite there yet. And in actual fact, I don't think it should be. What I think is more important is for companies to think about what what do they want to get out of where we are knowing that we're in this initial phase right so thinking about are we looking to you know for us success is everybody in the organization understanding their vision for what that is and that's what's success and that's something we should track uh, is another piece of it just trying to try things out and actually test ideas or try building new environments or like we say online retail environments etc and there might be an, a mini ROI on that, but it's really going to be more about that long-term view. Are we building our capabilities for tomorrow rather than trying to actually gain dollars and cents from our activities today? Um, so I think take the long view is, is the, the best way to answer that for the majority of companies. Thank you. Um, let's see, what are, the, what are some common questions you get from clients? about Web3? Maybe Natalie, then. maybe you could take that one. I think all three of us probably can comment on this one. <laughs> Some of the major questions are, you know, what is the, what are people's level of understanding? What does this mean? You know, what are some of the experiences that people are receptive to in terms of these different areas and types of experiences? Um, people are asking about the expectation of brands and how will people react if my brands in the metaverse and if we're not in the metaverse and should we lead or should we wait um, and how will consumers react to that and what are their expectations so I think there's a lot about just that whole idea of adoption and the barriers to adoption as well so is this going to be an experience that's accessible I think again Philip touched on this some of the uh, some of the different areas that might be risky or maybe that what did you say the good and the evil Philip uh, parts of this but maybe what are some of the risks like should I be anonymous um, how do I act in this metaverse experience so there's a number of societal issues that I think are also coming up as questions that we have to consider so it's not just about the commerce and maybe some of the concerts but clearly some issues about how I represent myself how do I create an avatar and should I create one that looks like me? So I think there's also a lot of emerging issues that we're getting questions around about how consumers will both represent themselves and the freedoms and maybe barriers that they might experience in these virtual worlds. Thank you. I think that's, a, oh, sorry, Yana or Philip, did you want to add to that? I think Natalie covered quite a bit of it, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I, we're at time, uh, but if there are any questions that we didn't get to, um, as Ellen mentioned, we will wrap those up via email. And then now I'd like to hand it back to Ellen just to close out and, um, you know, end, end the webinar today. Wow, I just really want to thank Yana, Nicole, Natalie, and Philip for a really interesting presentation. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Of course, at any time, we welcome the opportunity to speak with you. So please feel free to reach out to us directly. That now concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.